for The Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. You should be repulsed by evil. Evil is disgusting, and it's also terrifying. It's degradation and madness and sort of wanton destruction. But the thing that I try to keep in mind as I have those feelings is human beings don't actually have the power to render themselves inhuman by sin. So even a person who does something terrible, even a person who is very evil and has engaged in in really, really, really destructive behavior, still a human being. They still have that piece of, of goodness inside them. And that's worth preserving in every case. Once a person has done evil, they have destroyed a significant part of themselves. They have made that turn towards non-being, non-existence, chaos, disorder, and loss. And so when you execute a person who has already done that kind of moral damage to themselves, not to mention all the damage they've done to other people, but at that point, the only thing remaining in them is the good, which is that this is a human being alive and made in the image of the living God. And so at that point, that's all they have. And you're destroying it. This is For the Life of the World a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. I'm Evan Rosa with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. The day between Good Friday and Easter, it's that day of pause, of suspension, of silence. The day that Jesus harrows hell, as the Apostle Creed indicates, descending to the dead. Now, we get to think about Holy Saturday from the privileged position of knowing what happened on Sunday. But what could it have felt like to live through that first one? Those disciples who scattered, watched from a distance, tended to the tomb. What do you do in the wake of extinguished hope? Where do you go when the lights go out and all is dark? The silence of that loss is heavy and aching, and it reveals a slow, yawning pain. Was it all just a sham? Saturday is standing on the threshold of redemption, in the liminal transitional space that exists on the way from death to life. Full of waiting, held breath, hope without assurance, but also, somehow, rest. Sabbath. How can you rest when your whole world is falling apart? You rest in the restlessness. Let Jesus do the harrowing of hell. In today's timely episode, Ryan McAnally Lins is joined by Elizabeth Brunig of the New York Times to discuss her recent thinking and writing about the death penalty, perhaps best summed in her bracing piece released just days after the execution of Alfred Bourgeois, which she herself witnessed. There hadn't been a federal execution since 2003, 17 years. And then, starting in the summer of 2020, the Trump administration executed 13 inmates, including Alfred on December 11th. Liz's article, The Man I Saw Them Kill, is linked in the show notes and is not for the faint of heart. But her reflections on witnessing the death of Alfred Bourgeois bring you to the precipice of life and death, not just of Alfred, not just of death row inmates, but of our common humanity. So we thought it would be important and fitting to bring her onto the show this holy Saturday, this precipice between death and life. Thanks for listening. And here's to the brightness we expect tomorrow. Liz, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So back in December, you witnessed the execution of a federal death row inmate named Alfred Bourgeois. And from what I can gather, you asked to do that. That was not a assignment that you got. Why did you ask for that? Yeah, it was a situation where I had been in contact with Alfred's lawyers for many, many months because they handle a, a multitude of capital cases. And so I was actually interested in another case they had and had gotten in touch with them in, I think, 
uh, June of that year or earlier. Of course, shortly after that, Trump began this federal execution spree and pretty much all of the attorneys involved, not just these guys, but every single one of them for every inmate who was executed, they were all sort of caught flat footed because there hadn't been any federal executions in years and years. And the federal executions had been held up by, by litigation in court, a case called Roan. And all of a sudden, all of that just sort of crumbled. And so at that point, I started checking in with them fairly regularly. And it came about that their client, Alfred Bourgeois, was, was scheduled. And I asked if they wouldn't mind my attending and, and they agreed. And the reason that I wanted to do that, you know, there were multiple reasons. I think this federal execution spree, there was just such a density of executions. In some cases, the government was putting two or three inmates a week to death in a span of a few months, which was just unprecedented in the modern era. So there was quite a bit of media fatigue and you would see particular cases catch the press's interest, like Brandon Bernard, Lisa Montgomery, but the most of them just sort of, it was impossible to keep up with that level of killing. And I wanted to keep up with one of the cases that, you know, was clearly not going to be a cause celebrate because Alfred Bourgeois did do it and he was guilty and it, it was a terrible crime. And so it was never going to be a case that sort of caught the interest of folks like Kim Kardashian, because it's not as though there was a chance he was innocent. It's not as though he didn't understand what he was doing. And then the other reason was I always find, you know, in true crime, which is this incredibly popular genre, the crimes are made very vivid and very real for the victims. So we get a very, very clear and material and kind of fleshy sense of what happened to the victims. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's completely fair. And I think it's good practice journalistically, but you never get that for the executions, that sort of bodily humane view of what exactly happens to a person when they're put to death. And I wanted to, I wanted to render that. You, you wrote in one of your pieces, execution is theater. It, it's a weird kind of theater that doesn't have that, that detailed rendering right there it, it must be a kind of theater that is a theater of the dispassionate procedure is that right that's right i think for the public the major performance is the trial the capital sentencing trial where you get to hear everything this evil person did again you get those very detailed descriptions of the crime and of the suffering of the victim or victims. And then you get the catharsis of the capital sentence. This person is, is going to die. They, they got the one thing that their defense team was probably trying as hard as they possibly could to avoid the most severe sentence. They're going to be killed. And then they take them away and that's that. And I think that's very important to the public on a certain level. And then with this inner circle of people, victims, families, and, and so forth, the theater is perhaps more real because they are actually invited to view the execution in person. And so I think it functions on those two levels. But I do think the theater of dispassionate process is extremely important. And that was something that I could certainly see as a, as a witness. So you've now gone through both the normal public experience of this as just a citizen, but also then had a window into that other experience. And I found myself wondering, having seen those two facets of it, seen it in, from those two angles, what do you think the death penalty does to us as, as a people, as a society? I think anytime you're sitting around Hoping that someone is destroyed, that's a morally compromising position to be in. And theoretically, you would just hope that they stop. So even if you think about the most extreme cases like war, the hope is never that we annihilate the enemy. You don't want to say in, in World War II, the goal wasn't to just uh, put to death every single German or person in Japan. The goal was to win some kind of victory that caused them to stop fighting. And so execution is a situation where we've totally blown past that restraint goal. The person is already incapacitated. They're already in custody. 
They're usually almost always in solitary confinement. They're completely under our control. They're not going to be able to harm again. And so execution takes us right to that place where we're saying that's simply not enough. I want them, I want them completely annihilated. And I think that's a strange desire. I think it's difficult to explain. And I think the fact that it kind of defies reason, you can't really say in any rational sense why you want it other than it seems right and is emotionally satisfying. I think that's a sign that there's something that's irrational about it and desiring and glorifying these sort of uh, irrational and extreme uh, moves, it, it does take something from you morally and psychologically. And I have, I have a really hard time thinking about, you know, h- how it's good for any of us in society to be aware that there is this biased and imperfect and oftentimes incorrect procedure that we're using to kill people. And instead of saying, whoa, 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 if we can't get it right 100% of the time, we shouldn't be doing that. Instead of that, we end up making excuses for why it's okay to execute people, even though innocent people will die. And I think that is a, is a huge moral loss. It seems pretty clear. The fact of the matter is that that no no death penalty institution that has ever actually existed has been just in the sense of never executing innocent people and always only executing with what could be described accurately as fair procedures and equity across social lines of class, race, poverty, mental illness, things of that sort. Now, that that in itself might be a very strong argument just to say, even if in the ideal case, this would make sense as an institution, in practice, the cost is always just too high. But in your earlier comments, I, I heard something a little stronger than mm-hmm. that, which is that somehow the the impulse itself is suspect to you, that there you said something irrational, maybe about wanting right. to, to destroy. Wanting to destroy someone that you have complete control over. So I think there are, and I believe this is the, this is the current teaching of the Catholic Church. If you're in a situation where you're on a deserted island with 10 people, mm-hmm. say, and you're trying to establish some social order so that all of you can live, and one guy is just sort of willy-nilly attacking and killing people, it may well be the case that you don't have the infrastructure or the capacity there to incapacitate this person. And it may be the case that the only way to protect the society is to kill him. And I'm not saying that could never happen or has never happened in history. It just doesn't happen anymore, not here, not in the United States, not with the infrastructure and you know, capabilities we have. But I think in that situation, the correct attitude would be, this is awful. This is a, this is a further uh, bit of chaos, an indulgence of non-existence and loss and destruction that we're having to engage in because of radical evil. It's nothing to be excited about. And yet, when you do have executions in the United States, you very often have folks with signs and who are celebrating the execution, who are in favor of it. One woman that I heard speak whose son was executed, she was watching in the area set aside for the family members of the executed person. And she could hear the family members of the victim cheering and clapping as her son was executed. And she is just as innocent as they are. She's just as innocent as the victim. It's just that at that point as a society, we make a decision that that's too bad. It doesn't matter to us that she is perhaps in some way guilty or, or at least acceptable collateral. And I think those impulses are the ones that I find really, really concerning. And, and it's not that I don't have them. I have them at times. It's, it's certainly the case that people can commit crimes that make me feel like they should be themselves wiped off the face of the earth and eliminated from the cosmos. But I know that those impulses are not the the best in me. What do you think those impulses, I mean, is that the end of what they want or do they want that elimination, that wiping out to accomplish something else? Yeah, I think it's this intense revulsion at evil 
And that's a good thing in and of itself. You should be repulsed by evil. Evil is disgusting and it's also terrifying. It's degradation and madness and sort of wanton destruction. I actually think, did you see the movie The Witch with a, a V and a V? In the I have never in fact seen it. Style. Well, I, you know, I wouldn't ask anyone who's particularly sensitive to violence to see the film, but I, but what I do think is great about it is that it takes the idea of evil 100% seriously and it depicts it without any romance or glamour. It is just degradation, suffering, madness, and loss. I think it's totally normal and totally human and good to recoil from those things. And those are often elements we see in crimes. But the thing that I try to keep in mind as I have those feelings is human beings don't actually have the power to render themselves inhuman by sin. We don't have that capacity. So even a person who does something terrible, even a person who is very evil and has engaged in in really, really, really destructive behavior still a human being they still have that piece of of goodness inside them and that's worth preserving in every case that reminds me a lot of what what augustine had to say about the death penalty which is it's one of the places where his sharp distinction between the sin and the person comes into play he says yes hate the sin oppose it but you have to love the nature no matter what you have to love the nature and then he actually winds up opposing the death penalty because because in his theology, if you put somebody to death, you've ended the temporal course within which they might repent. Yes. So you've 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 condemned them if they have not repented and you put them to death, you've condemned them to hell for for all you know. Right. So that that the sure that's an argument against the death penalty. At the same time, the kind of impulse that you're identifying <laughs> is. Uh, hell yes, we condemn them to hell. Yes, like, yeah, yeah, right. Some that's, people, that's what we're going for. Yeah, it, it right? seems that some people ultra, ultra, ultra have it coming. Now, that would include all of us on some level, uh, but you could even say some more than others. The Lord might disagree with that characterization, but I think there's there's church teaching to support that. Now, the thing about crime and and evil is once a person has done evil, they have destroyed a significant part of themselves. They have made that turn towards non-being, non-existence, chaos, disorder, and loss. And so when you execute a person who has already done that kind of moral damage to themselves, not to mention all the damage they've done to other people, but at that point, the only thing remaining in them is the good, which is that this is a human being alive and made in the image of the living God. And so at that point, that's all they have and you're destroying it. And that always seems really backwards to me. You should give them the opportunity, as Augustine says, to repent and to rebuild and restore everything that they destroyed in themselves when they did what they did. That, that idea of, of restoration reminds me of, of something you wrote at the end of your piece in December. You said nothing was restored, nothing was gained. There isn't any justice in it, nor satisfaction, nor reason. There was nothing, nothing there. And that really left me with this sense of the kind of unfulfilled hope that the the death penalty is kind of offering us something. Execution Mm -hmm. is... It, it, it's making a promise it can't keep or, or we're, we're investing it with hopes that it can't fulfill. And I wonder if it's something like we're looking for this, this restitution to wholeness as some sort of return to how things were before. Really, the, like the only truly satisfactory response to the evil that has been done would, it, would be it not having been done. Uh, right. Yes. But exactly. there's no such thing as that. There is. There is. It's just not in this, not in this realm. Well, that, right. So that, that raises for, for me, it's the kind of what that, what the detailed recounting of horrible crime, I mean, what you do in your article. Oh yeah, absolutely. I didn't want to hide the ball. Yeah. Right. Right. What, and what that does is for me, it both evokes 
that desire. And at the same time, for me, it raises a really pointed the Odyssey question because we'll be actually because I don't, I don't think it can ever not have been right. It yeah. always will have been. Yes. And the question is, well, maybe maybe there are two forms of the question. Can it be made right or can things be made right enough that it's having been isn't like a permanent marring of the creation? Yeah. Well, so here's here's, you know, I have thought about that quite a lot. And the way I look at it is this. And actually, the University of Chicago philosopher Agnes Callard is really fantastic on this and really got me thinking about this in earnest. Harm can't be undone, right? So my dad, if you say my dad beat me as a child and you can wish for everything you're worth, that had never happened. The person can apologize to you. The relationship can be repaired, reestablished, and can form into a good relationship. You can forgive. They can ask forgiveness and all of that. And it will still be the case that it happened to you. And what you want for all the world is for it to never have happened. I want you to have loved me from the beginning. I want you to have not hurt me. That's the actual desire. And that cannot ever happen. It cannot be met. That desire cannot be fulfilled. So we move on to other desires. I want you to feel bad. I want you to make some sort of restitution, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all things that are other than undoing the harm. Okay, so that's just something we have to live with in, in human existence, right? That once someone hurts you, you are hurt. And it is never going to be any different than that. You might not always suffer to the same degree you do the moment that it happens. And you may in time or even relatively quickly feel good on net, but it will always be a harm that was done to you. I think we can all recognize that. And so then the question is, well, what can we do about the fact that harm is so permanent and capital punishment arises as this seemingly a commensurate answer, right? This is permanent. This can't be undone, but it still doesn't undo the harm. <laughs> it's, it, it may seem symmetrical in a literary sense, but, but functionally, it doesn't actually do anything to undo the harm. And, and so therefore, I, I tend to think once that kind of harm has been done, you're on your heels in a certain respect. And the question is just what can we preserve? What can we prevent from being destroyed even further? And the life of the individual who committed the crime, that's oftentimes one of the things we can preserve. And you don't have to like them. I mean, you don't have to love them even. I would, you know, recommend it. I think that's certainly what the faith would recommend. But it certainly it doesn't require that level of moral heroism to say, let's not kill this person. Let's let them live. And then I can be done with it or move on or, or something else. But I think that's where I, I come down on that. And then all of the ledger is corrected in the kingdom of God. So this, this episode is going to be released on Holy Saturday. So that moment where liturgically Christ is in the tomb. Mm -hmm. And that at least raises the the opportunity to reflect a little bit about you spoke about what you know what can we do but we can also ask what has god done what what has been done and what if any significance does that have for how we ought to live yeah i think that's a really good way of of thinking about it so christ overcomes death i think that's very significant because what it indicates is is precisely that that ledger is correctable right Lightning does strike twice. Things that you don't think are possible do happen. Harm can be undone. And so the metaphysical possibility we have to accept is that in the kingdom of God, which is a life that is not less real than life on earth, but is actually more real, in which we are not less human, but actually more human than we are now. In that world, which is the world to come, the ledger is corrected. The things that happened unhappen. That's possible. 
Now, there is some interesting writing. I think Augustine, for instance, says that in heaven, the martyrs who died for the faith retain their wounds, <laughs> which is sort of gnarly to think about. And, and so that would suggest something along the lines of, well, actually, some harms are sort of transcendent. But I think for Augustine, those are sort of marks that uh, materially represent the closeness of the martyr to Christ. So you, you can probably put those folks in their own category, which we do as a faith anyway. But it, it is possible and it will come to pass that the things that were done that damaged you or made you less or hurt you or broke your heart or incapacitated certain parts of you that should be flourishing and sensitive and outward looking, it, it maybe made them shyer, weaker, that all of those things will be reversed. And you see that in the resurrection. Christ comes back. He's human, but he, not, not in the way that we are, right? Not fragile and not broken, but fully and, and vigorously human, right? He asks for something to eat. Uh, he offers his hands to be touched. He calls to Mary Magdalene by her first name. This is just a, a fully human person in community, embodied, living a bodily life. And that, I think, is an excellent demonstration of what we have to look forward to in the life to come. It's, it's interesting that you bring up you bring up Augustine on the scars of the the wounds of the martyrs. Miroslav Wolf here at Yale, the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, in fact, has staked out what I take it to be a pretty controversial claim that that in fact in the full the glorified and ascended Christ's wounds are no longer evident because sin, in fact, just will not come to mind in mm -hmm. the world to come, and it, it has been not erased from history it happened but kind of erased from the practical history of that life and he he talks about about the kind of what what would be the social conditions of the possibility of this and th this is where i think it touches a little bit on what we've we've been talking about with respect to crime right because this is where there's been there's been interpersonal wrongdoing mm -hmm. interpersonal harm and maybe one of the most offensive things about the ideas that you've just brought up is there could be the suggestion that you've kind of got to live forever in this life with, with the person who harmed you. Right. Yes. And, and so Miroslav says, look, this is, this is all speculation as we're doing when we do this kind of theology. Right. But it would really seem that there has to be a sort of social reconciliation that goes along with the judgment. That settling of accounts can't just be kind of like God saying, this is how it ought to have been. This is how it was. See the gap. So you're in the wrong. All of that sort of stuff. There has to also be then kind of like a subjective and intersubjective owning of that such that there can be restored relationships and not just restored bodies, restored lives. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that's possible. There's nothing that indicates to me that that... Um couldn't be the case. I would think that, you know, the model for this would maybe be the prodigal son. And like I said, when people do evil, they don't just hurt other people. They morally damage themselves. I would hope that once that moral damage was undone, once people are fully restored to their moral capacity as a human being, they themselves would desire a reconciliation, would desire forgiveness, not just from the Lord, but from, from the community and the community would desire to grant it. That would be my hope that it wouldn't have to be. And I don't think, let me say, I wouldn't expect that it would be a you know, sort of traumatic and coerced reconciliation, like a, like a struggle session. I would think of it more along the lines of when you are in your full moral capacity as a human being, you have regret and you have desire for reconciliation. You also have desire to reconcile. And, and the, the hope, the hope that I have is, and the ability, my, my own experience of these things limited, of course, is, is even when there's the desire, somehow the ability can be evasive. What and I tend I, to think about it, it is hard. It is hard, you know, and, and the only thing that I think about in those cases, and I've been in them is, is, is what the, the father says to the, to the elder son. You were always with me. Why are you complaining that I forgave the prodigal son and that I welcomed him back into my arms and back into our community? Why are you upset about that? 
I've given you everything. You were always here. Your adhering to my commands is its own reward. And that's all I try to keep in mind, which is sort of, and it reminds me of when I would do something and get in trouble. And then I would say to my parents, but my brother, and they would say, why don't you let us worry about John? We'll parent John. You pay attention to what you're doing. And that was, it turned out to be, I think, very moving to me. And, and, and it's how I try to reconcile a lot of these feelings. Also, have you seen the, the meme of like a hen with a tiny chick, like poking out of her feathers? And I think the meme text says, sorry, I can't. My mom said no. Um, <laughs> but there is also that verse in, in scripture where God says he's like a hen wanting to draw us all to him. And I'll often imagine myself when I'm feeling particularly wounded as uh, and this is as, as much evidence of, of being brain poisoned by the Internet as anything else. But I'll imagine myself as that chick. Like hiding, <laughs> hiding in God's wing and, and feeling like whatever else anyone does, however angry anyone else makes me, I am here with the Lord. He has me. I'll be okay. I have it in me to forgive because I have everything my father has, which is everything there is. I, I have to say that is an utterly unexpected intertext. But but I, I but I'm actually be, I'm, I'm, I'm be feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I I understand what you're saying. Imagine your pastor up at the altar clicking through a PowerPoint of memes. I feel like that might be the future of the church. <laughs> God forgive me. <laughs> so so I feel I feel like our conversation has 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 kind of wandered in this theological direction that now feels very far from United States public culture. Sorry about that. And the uh, well, this is where I love to be, but it does raise the question for me. Like our jumping off point, there was an article in a series where you've been making some pretty straightforwardly pointed public calls for policy things. And I was wondering if you might speak a little bit about the state of affairs there, what your hopes are, what you think people ought to be advocating for, how do you think they ought to be doing it, if you have any thoughts on these things? Yeah. So in terms of the death penalty, it, it, at this point, it is a state by state policy. And so when or if it it, it, it ends, it will end uh, slowly in in that it'll have to go state by state. And uh, there's, there's quite a bit of belief in the activist community that there won't necessarily be bans like the ban, the abolition that just took place in Virginia and, and has then, you know, similar abolitions have taken place in other sort of red states, even like New Hampshire, where the legislature, I believe, overrode a veto from the governor, which is quite remarkable. There will be sort of impressive abolition movements and moments like that. But I think a lot of activists believe by and large, many states will just stop using it and it'll remain on the books, but will effectively end in practice. That's a little less comforting because you could get a sort of wild card figure who, who comes in and decides to reactivate it. That's what happened with Trump and Barr and these federal executions. But on the other hand, there are plenty of states where nobody has been executed despite the legality of it in a long time. And so I think that's one way that you might see it sort of trail off. On the federal level, what Trump and Barr did was totally unprecedented. They came out of nowhere after more than a decade's pause, I think almost two decades, in, yeah, the last federal execution, I believe, had been in 2003 before Trump and Barr resumed in 2020. And it was totally unexpected. And they rushed them through. And I think that demonstrates that the system is not particularly capable of protecting itself from those kinds of what I think could arguably be described as abuses, All right? The Supreme Court was issuing opinions literally in the middle of the night at 2.45, 3 a.m., giving the okay to these executions when their lawyers had little to no time to, to try to do anything about it. Can I ask you something about that? Because that was, that was just as a startling feature of this to me. How often does the Supreme Court render decisions in the middle of the night? And like, what are the nine justices doing when that happens? Do you have any idea? <laughs> I, you know, that's all very opaque to me. I reached out to Justice Sotomayor, who wrote some of the the dissents on these cases. And, and she was excellent in her dissents. They were very eloquent. I think they were very, very well reasoned, just a layperson's opinion, and obviously I'm motivated to agree. But I would 
I would highly suggest even people who disagree with me on that point, just read her opinions with an open mind. But it, it was very unusual, unprecedented, shocking. These capital defense attorneys who, this is far from their first rodeo, were stunned. I think Rebecca Woodman is one of them. She wrote an article about the execution of her client, Wesley Perky, which you guys can go read, listeners, if you're interested. But you can see the level of just shock and alarm at what was happening with the courts among these sort of veteran capital defense attorneys. And, and it, is, it is sort of unthinkable. Sorry for the digression. <laughs> you were, no, no, no. I think you were pushing in the direction of kind of where the federal right. situation stands. Yeah. And so federally, the death penalty remains legal. There are 40 something, I believe almost 50 uh, inmates on federal death row. I have uh, zero belief that Biden has any intention of going forward with any federal executions. The Obama administration didn't carry out any federal executions, but they did continue to defend capital sentences in court when they were challenged. And they allowed U.S. attorneys to continue seeking capital sentences. And so while no one was killed, there were names being added to the ledger. There are several things Biden could and I think should do to sort of lift up on the gas a little bit. What he could do is on the wish list side of things, he could commute every sentence on federal death row all of them to life in prison. He could uh, withdraw notice that has been distributed already of, uh, of intent to seek capital punishment that goes to these defense attorneys. He could withdraw those notices and instruct U.S. attorneys to no longer seek uh, capital sentences in, in any case. So that would stop new folks from being added to federal death row. They could stop defending capital sentences in court, which would result in some folks having their sentences reduced and, and, and could potentially commute all those sentences. But nothing is going to be as permanent as legislation. And there is legislation on the floor, right? There's bicameral legislation to abolish the federal death penalty that Reps Presley and Espiot uh, and Senator Durbin have all been behind. And I, I think President Biden should heartily support that legislation and try to move it through Congress. I think that is ultimately the safest, most permanent and most um, moral way uh, to get rid of the federal death penalty. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really striking that the Obama administration was adding names to the ledger, as you said, mm -hmm. because, well, the, what's coming to mind for me is, so the theologian Jürgen Moltmann had mm -hmm. this correspondence with a woman who was on death row in Georgia, Kelly Gissendanner, and... I've only heard Moltmann recount this, so I haven't looked into the, the news stories, but it, it seems that she was on the verge of being executed two times before kind of last minute stays and things of that sort. And then yeah. the third time she was, in fact, executed. And it's it seems to me that there's something there's something distorted <laughs> <laughs> about the having of a death row, even if you're not executing people, right? You kind of you can kind of imagine if we kept getting capital sentences but never executed people, there would be this expanding population of people on death row, and then eventually they would die of some other cause. But there would be this entire time when, at any moment, the the thing could shift, and and it would it seemed to be a social decision to kind of hang the sword of Damocles over people, which. It, it, it just, it, that seems off to me. <laughs> right. And I mean, I think what we're seeing there is, is a political decision. And the political calculation is this. People will get really, really mad and fussy. And, and in, in this case, the Obama administration is probably thinking about conservatives if they simply made a move to abolish the federal death penalty, or if they simply commuted all the sentences, or if they stopped defending them or something. I think that there is a possibility there would be some upset among certain segments of the right. Although worth saying, I think that there are a lot of folks on the right who I think would, would support that actually. But at any rate, that's the concern is they don't want to spend political capital on criminals, people who've done terrible things. The tweets write themselves. Here's the Obama administration sticking their neck out to defend Alfred Bourgeois, who beat his two and a half year old daughter to death in the inside cab of a semi truck. No one wants to deal with that. And I, I, I interviewed recently Cardinal Dolan about Biden and the death penalty. And, and there's that other issue of abortion that stands in the way. Democrats 
want to come to the defense of folks on death row and they want to eliminate it. And a lot of that rhetoric is about how killing is wrong. And I fully agree with that. And then you have folks like Tom Cotton who will immediately come out with a tweet saying, oh, so you can beat a two and a half year old to death and we shouldn't execute you. But if you are whatever, eight month fetus, they'll, there will be those kinds of comparisons which are politically difficult for the Democrats to contend with. And so I think that factored a great deal into this kind of path the Obama administration tried to carve where they weren't killing anyone and they weren't uh, particularly, well, they were, let's say, intentionally sluggish about getting through the litigation that was in court that was holding up the federal executions. They weren't really interested in resolving that because they didn't want to execute anyone. But neither did they want to expend the political capital to make sure that none of those people would be executed by a future administration. So it's just about finding an administration, and I hope it's President Biden's that's willing to take that risk. So, so you have hope. Uh, you hope that that an administration will be willing to take that risk. I wonder if you might close by giving your kind of your summation of why others ought to join you in that hope. Yeah, well, I think there are any number of reasons to be against the death penalty. I think there's a huge universe of reasons. It's uh, extremely time consuming. Families go through decades of appeals and near misses. So as you mentioned with Kelly Gis and Donner, sometimes the families will fly out to witness an execution. The individual will be in the chamber and then their team will get a last minute stay. And families can go through that multiple times or each time the defendant secures a stay, uh, the DA will go round up the family members and have them get back on TV and relive everything again. It's extremely protracted and extremely difficult for families uh, of victims. It's also extremely protracted and very difficult for families of offenders who are innocent. They didn't do anything wrong. And they're also going through this. It's expensive. It costs a ton of money. People say, I don't want to pay for someone to live. Well, that's what you're doing with the death penalty, you're paying an extra amount of money for them to live often decades after the sentence because of the appeals process. And, and so I think there are plenty of those sort of practical concerns to think through. I think the possibility of innocent people being executed at just this month, two intellectually disabled brothers in North Carolina were exonerated. They had been on death row. And frankly, there are organizations that keep track of this, but there have been something like 75 exonerations of intellectually disabled people who gave false confessions under coercion. The system is not well vetted against that kind of thing. And if none of that is disturbing and none of the practical concerns are moving, I would just say, what is it doing for us? Is it helping us? Is it doing anything for us? Or is it just wetting an appetite that is one we shouldn't have to begin with. Thank you, Liz. This has been a really great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured journalist Elizabeth Brunig and theologian Ryan mcanally lins Production assistance by Martin Chan. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edited and produced the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. New episodes drop every Saturday, with the occasional midweek. If you're new to the show, we're so glad that you found us. Remember to hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. And if you've been listening for a while, Thank you, friends. If you're liking what you're hearing, I've got a request. Would you support us? It's pretty simple, really, and won't take much time. Here are some ideas. First, you could hit the share button for this episode in your app and send a text or email to a friend or share it to your social feed. Second, you could give us an honest rating on Apple Podcasts. How are we really doing? Finally, you could write a short review of the show in Apple Podcasts. Reviews are cool because they'll help like-minded people get an idea for what we're all about and what's most meaningful to you, our listeners. Thanks for listening today, friends. We'll be back with more this coming week. 